I'm excited to uh, introduce Dr. Daniel Smith. Um, he is one of the MS specialists here at Ohio Health. He did his uh, undergraduate training at the Ohio State University, and then he went on to the University of Cincinnati uh, to do his medical school, and then he continued there in his neurology residency training. He then went on to the University of Colorado, where he completed a fellowship in autoimmune neurology, neuroinfectious diseases, and multiple sclerosis. And I'm very excited to hear his talk. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Dan Smith. Can everybody hear me okay? We good? All right. All right, so um, try not to fall asleep after that lunch. <laughs> what we'll do today is talk a little bit about stem cells. And I went backwards instead of forward. I have no disclosures. Here's what I would like to talk about today. Um, the first thing we'll do is we'll spend just a few minutes kind of reviewing what is a stem cell, uh, what are the different types of stem cells. We'll then get into what is a stem cell transplant, and specifically the type of stem cell transplant that we're talking about is an autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplant, or H A H S C T. We'll talk a little bit about what we know about stem cells in regards to MS from some trials that have been done. We will talk about side effects that we know can occur, some of the safety and toxicity information that we've learned from these experiments. We'll spend just a minute or two talking about a different type of stem cell that's called a mesenchymal stem cell. And then we'll talk about some of the things that uh, we need to keep in mind. Although this is a very exciting new field, there are some cautionary points too that we'll kind of go through. So what is a stem cell? Basically a stem cell is probably best defined as a source of raw material for our body. So these are cells that can become other stem cells or they can di differentiate into different uh, types of tissues throughout the body. And when you hear the word stem cell, a lot of times people mean different things by that. One uh, common or, or, or thing that most people maybe associate when they hear stem cell is embryonic stem cell. And what this is, is a cell that is actually a part of um, us as we form. When we're just literally three, four, five days old in a structure that's called a blastocyst, which we'll show a picture of in a second. And these cells are what we call pluripotent. They can literally do just about anything. They can replicate themselves and they can replicate, or excuse me, they can differentiate into other types of tissues. Adult stem cells are a little bit different. These are, still have the capability to do lots of things, but they're already somewhat predetermined in the pathway that they're gonna go down. And so the example that we'll talk about extensively is an adult stem cell, particularly um, of, the, of the bone marrow. It's possible to take an adult stem cell, uh, an adult cell, excuse me, and actually give it chemicals and give it growth factors and have it revert back to a stem cell, which is really cool. Because one question is, how do we get these stem cells? They're hard to get. And so one up and coming area and focus is, can we actually take cells that are maybe already differentiated and then back them up a little bit to actually cause them to become a stem cell? And there are also perinatal stem cells that are found within the umbilical cord and amniotic fluid. So an embryonic stem cell, um, like I was mentioning earlier, is found within this uh, structure called a blastocyst, which is an early developing uh, baby, essentially. And these are the cells that are the most pluripotent, or the build, they have the most ability to do different things later on in life. Adult stem cells are still really cool, but have a little bit more, um, less, a slightly more limitation into what they can do. So hematopoietic stem cells, these guys uh, over here, um, typically are found within our bone marrow and within our blood and within the umbilical cord blood. Mesenchymal stem cells, these are cells that are kind of more found in like tissues, heavy duty tissues like pulp, uh, fat tissue and things like this. This concept of an induced pluripotent stem cell that I mentioned earlier, um, is the idea of uh, actually being able to, and I apologize, this it didn't show up very well here, but um, basically taking a cell that's already 
doing what it's going to do, giving it chemicals so that it becomes more of a stem cell can be used for more uh, a, a diversity of purposes later in life. There's a little bit less um, going on in terms of how we can use these types of stem cells right now in MS compared to some of the other forms. And this is another uh, thing that we should mention when we talk about stem cell and stem cell research. But there is this thing called somatic cell nuclear transfer. And what it basically is, is taking an egg and pulling out the genetic material from inside the egg. This is supposed to be somebody's cell over here. You take their DNA, put it inside this egg, and then what happens is this egg basically takes those initial cells and divides and divides and divides. And this can be done to another way of creating stem cells. This is actually uh, cloning, or essentially. And so this is how they created everyone's favorite sheep, Dolly the sheep, through this uh, technique of nuclear transfer. All right, so now that we kind of got those basics in, what is a stem cell transplant? The idea here is we are replacing someone's blood and lymphoid system with, we're resetting it. We're basically giving them stem cells uh, so that they can grow a new system. And when we say these terms, these are important to know, graft, that term, what that means is that's just the same thing as a stem cell. When an allogenic graft means that we are giving the stem cells from a donor. So an example of this would be someone who, for instance, let's say has like a leukemia or a lymphoma, they need their bone marrow um, replaced, and so a donor will provide stem cells for that patient, a healthy donor, um, so that they can grow a new system. But an autologous uh, graft, this is your own stem cells. So this is uh, your own stem cells have been taken out of you, multiplied, and then they're given back to you. And that's the concept behind this AHSCT that we'll be talking about. So the purpose, and this is one thing I think is kind of important to drive home, the whole purpose of AHSCT, this technique, is basically resetting our immune system. It's taking our immune system, uh, ablating it, getting rid of it, giving us stem cells to grow it anew, hopefully so that it is more tolerant and doesn't cause as much MS activity later on in life. But it's actually not as much to regrow or replace old damage that's already happened. So hematopoietic stem cells, these guys up here, have the ability to turn into lymphocytes like B and T cells, um, different types of immune system cells called granulocytes, and then even our platelets and our red blood cells. So they have the ability to basically derive all these different components of our blood and immune system. So when someone gets a stem cell transplant, this is what happens. There are four steps to it. Uh, the first two are basically ways to get as many stem cells out of the bone marrow and into the blood as possible, and then to collect them. And this can take anywhere from 5 to 15 days, depending upon how it's done. The next uh, couple steps of the process are a little bit more intensive. This is when someone's immune system, their uh, bone marrow is ablated with chemotherapy and the new, or the, the existing stem cells are then put in place there so that they can regrow and recreate the immune system. When someone, uh, when a patient's getting that done, they have to come into the hospital and they're usually there for quite a long time. They can be there three or four, even five weeks at times. This is a nice graph that kind of shows the whole process and different things that are happening through time. So on the very bottom, what you can see is this is a patient who's gonna have a stem cell transplant and the very first, um, Part of the process is mobilization of their stem cells. And what we're going to do, as you can see through time here, there's different phases of what they're going through. If you look up here, you can see what their white blood cell counts are doing at the various points. And then these are the different types of chemo that we'll talk about that, that are basically given to help make these things occur. So the first thing we'll do is we'll talk about mobilization. This is basically just getting the stem cells out of your bone marrow. And the best way to do it is with this thing called GCSF, which basically stimulates your bone marrow to spill out as many stem cells as possible. And we also sometimes find that cyclophosphamide, which is a chemo medication, is given. And sometimes that sounds kind of counterintuitive because that's something that we normally think of as being destructive and getting rid of cells. But by giving the cyclophosphamide just for mobilization, sometimes we see that there's an actual better, as they call it, harvest of these stem cells. The way that it's given, typically, 
involves a lot of hydration to keep the kidneys healthy. And it also, sometimes this medication can be toxic to our bladder. And so there's prophylactic medications that are given to help prevent complications from that. So we've got the patient down here who's coming in and they've received their cyclophosphamide and then their GCSF. These are the medicines to basically pump all those cells out of their bone marrow. And you can see that their, uh, their, their cell counts go up quite a bit. And we go next to the process of collecting these. So leukophoresis is the term that basically means filtering out white blood cells, uh, all types of blood cells from the patient and collecting the ones that we want. So when you try to collect these stem cells, there are different ways to do it. There's some techniques where you can actually go and look at the different markers on the surface of stem cells. One of them is called CD34. And the question is, well, geez, does it make sense to actually just try to select specifically for these 34 cells because they seem to be the best types of stem cells? But there's other fields of medicine who've been doing stem cell transplants a lot longer than we have, actually. And so, particularly um, in the rheumatology literature, uh, a lot of patients get, uh, have, or not a lot, but patients have had stem cells done for other conditions, including lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, um, scleroderma. And what we see in those cases is that doesn't, maybe does not actually make a huge difference if this CD4 molecule is selected for or not. And it adds a lot of complexity. Um, and sometimes even toxicity to the, to the procedure. So in other words, it's a long way of saying that there's different ways to do it, and it's still kind of debated whether or not this needs to be done for. But these, these cells are collected and then frozen until they're ready to be used. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on uh, what we call the conditioning part of the protocol. And this is when a patient is now in the hospital, and they're basically given different strengths of chemotherapy to wipe out their bone marrow. And when this occurs, um, different aspects of our immune system are essentially depleted. There's different ways that this can be done. And there's three general regimens that can be used. And they have totally different risk factors associated with them. High intensity protocols typically use really kind of effective but toxic chemotherapy medications. Or even whole body radiation plus the cyclophosphamide that we mentioned. Um, and so this is a way of doing this, but definitely comes at a little bit more potential risk to the patient. An intermediate regimen, these are commonly used and probably have been used more than any of the other regimens that are out there. BEAM or BEAM is basically just abbreviating the names of the different types of chemo that are given. But we see that probably historically this guy has been used more than any of the other regimens to help do this particularly in a lot of the European stem cell trials. And then there's a low intensity regimen, which is now kind of becoming in vogue and has been used in some of the most recent uh, stem cell trials. The idea here, here is, can we still uh, get rid of the immune system, but do so in a little bit less toxic manner? So one medicine that is given to help get rid of the immune system, in addition to what we've talked about, is something called ATG. And this is really cool, it stands for antithomicide globulin. And what happens is, basically a patient's uh, T cells are given to particularly uh, a horse or sometimes a rabbit. And the, the animal's immune system will then make antibodies against those T cells. The antibodies are collected and then given back to us as humans. And so it's essentially, it's a way of, of giving ourselves antibodies to get rid of parts of our own immune system. And ATG can be used uh, in these different stem cell protocols. This also didn't show up real well here, but um, there have been a fair number of stem cell trials. And what this graph is trying to depict is that there are, like I mentioned, sort of three different regimens or intensities of the chemotherapy that can be used to get rid of the immune system. There are some that are more aggressive that are up here in this, in this part of the graph. There are some that are kind of right in the middle or intermediate. There are some that are down here that are still effective, but maybe slightly less toxic. And we're going to give an example of a couple trials that kind of followed each of these different formats. We'll talk about a 2016 trial very briefly um, that used a high intensity regimen. We'll talk about a regimen called HALT-MS, a trial that came out that used intermediate strength. And then we'll, use, we'll talk about the most recent trial, which used a low intensity strength. So this is a long-winded way of basically just pointing out that each of these protocols is different. There's no like standard exact way that this is done. Um, in some cases, when the cells are mobilized, 
chemotherapy might be given by cyclophosphamide. In other cases, maybe not. In some cases, the grafts or the stem cells are enriched for these 34 cells, which adds another layer of complexity. In other cases, that's not the case. The actual chemo that's given to the patient to get rid of their immune system can vary. It can be the high, the medium, or the low strength of consolidation. And then sometimes the ATG that I mentioned is used and other times not. So we have different ways that this process can vary. When you look at over the last 20, 25 years, patients who have had stem cell transplants or MS, this is a review, it takes a look at 281 patients. And what you'll find is that generally speaking, the most common regimen is this intermediate intensity. So that's nearly 64% of patients. And then still used but less commonly, we see the high intensity regimen around 19% of the time, and we see the low intensity regimen around 17% of the time. So here we are again. We've talked about uh, the patient coming in and getting the medications to mobilize their stem cells. We talked about harvesting their stem cells and freezing them. Uh, we have talked about them coming into the hospital to get chemo so that their um, immune system um, is, is knocked down. And then we're now left in the place where we have to give uh, the stem cells back and then give their immune system time to regenerate. And as you can imagine during this period of time, because we got rid of the immune system, people are gonna be more susceptible to infections. And so it's important to be careful um, that we do the right thing so that people are less likely to get sick. As an example, um, herpes viruses are super common in many people. And uh, we oftentimes will have patients go on acyclovir which is a medication to prevent these viruses from reactivating. Same goes for other types of uh, antibiotics to prevent infections. Um, and then sometimes the blood is actually checked on periodic intervals just to be sure that no virus is coming out that shouldn't be there. This whole process is really complicated in terms of how does the immune system reset. But to sort of summarize it, what we see is destruction of the old bone marrow cells that were there introduction of stem cells, which then are given time to expand and grow and to see the presence of new foreign invaders and to re-kind of create their army. The idea here is that they come back, and when they come back, they come back in a way that is less likely to attack our own body. And one really cool thing is this thing that we always think of as just a piece of rubber in our neck, the thymus, which is a little gland that goes away and shrinks down when we're an adult. This actually kind of gets a boost during this time. It will enlarge and it will regrow and the thymus will actually spit out more T cells or immune cells as this process happens. <clears throat> and what we see at the end of this is that the cells come back, like I've mentioned, in a way that's more tolerant. Um, and I won't go into all these specifics, but essentially what we see are that the T cells as well as the B cells, which are two important arms of the immune system, come back in a different way. Um, and when we actually take an immune system cell after this process and we look at its genetic material, it actually has characteristics of somebody who never had um, MS to start with. And so in a lot of ways, we see that the genetics, at, even at the level of genetics, there's been a change. And when you look at what these different populations of our immune system cells do, what you see is essentially a rebalancing. We see that some cells called memory cells go down, and we see that cells um, that, are, that are new, that are newly emerging, start to increase in number. Um, and the, the, whole, the whole idea is that it's a total rebalancing act so that there's more uh, tolerability, there's less attack on our own brain and spinal cord than there was previously. So what we'll do here is we'll go through um, a couple of trials but we won't spend forever, I promise, on it. But just to kind of give you the quick take-home points. This is an important one to talk about. HALT-MS was a trial that completed in 2017. And this was a group of MS patients, 24 of them, who were followed for over five years. Um, they all had relaxing MS. So they all had MS with signs of active inflammation. And they all also had been on prior MS medications and had not done very well. They had breakthrough disease activity. And so in this study, what happened is that they received stem cell transplants. And the way that they did this was an intermediate regimen um, as opposed to the high and the low. This one was right in the middle. 
Uh, and so what happened with these patients? So the thing that was looked at was how many of them over five years had all of these things, no worsening symptoms, no signs of new relapses, and no changes on their brain scans, and a large percentage actually, 69%, which is what this graph is showing, met all of those endpoints together. And when you break it down piece by piece, you see that nearly 91% of patients had no progression of five years, 87% relapse-free, 86% had no MRI activity at five years. Important to remember, these patients had relaxing MS, not progressive MS. And also, one thing that's really cool, patients got better at the end of the trial. We saw that the EDSS, which is a marker of how uh, much disability someone has, there was actually an improvement in their disability scores. The rates of brain shrinkage also got better. The takeaway point from this study was that stem cell therapy can be very effective, particularly in patients who are uh, in a highly active group. In other words, they have lots of inflammation and they have clinical relapses. So let's change gears and we'll go to another trial. This one um, took place in 2016 in Canada. And uh, the thing that was different about this group was that not all of them had relapsing MS. Probably half of them were actually progressive. So their MS was at a point where it wasn't as much no, more inflammation and new changes on their MRI scans as much as it was a slowly getting worse type of picture. Um, now this time they got the high intensity protocol, so they got the big guns when it came to sort of uh, getting rid of their bone marrow before it was replaced. And they were followed for just shy of seven years and we saw that 70% had no changes uh, on their MRI at three years. 35% had improvement in their actual clinical state and their EDSS or their disability score. Um, their brain volumes also uh, started to improve. The, the, uh, the rate of brain shrinkage, there's some brain shrinkage every year in our MS patients and we found that, that as we've seen in other studies with really effective uh, treatments that uh, we can see improvements in the rate of brain atrophy. So this is a really cool um, graph that I wanted to show you. So, I look, it looks like a lot, but here's what I'm trying to drive home. This, these are all the patients. Every time you see a red triangle, that's a relapse that they had. Right down the middle, that's when they got their stem cell transplant. And you can see, after the fact, there was really 167 relapses before, but none after. Um, when you look at the patients who had MRIs, well, they all had MRIs, but uh, every, little, every little mark is an MRI, and when there's a new lesion on the MRI, it's a, it's a triangle, a red triangle. So we had um, 188 enhancing lesions prior to the stem cell transplant and none after. So it drives home the point that uh, this technique may have the power to really effectively shut down inflammation, at least in terms of looking at relapses as well as brain MRI changes. So those things I just showed you were um, there were trials, but there was nothing. They got stem cell treatments, but none of them had anything else to compare it against. Um, so what we'd like to see is how does it compare against other, other things, other treatments that we have. The first time this was done um, was, a, uh, it was a trial where patients could get stem cell transplants or they could have a treatment that we actually really don't use anymore, um, mitoxantrone, um, which is a somewhat toxic medication, but has been used previously. So it's kind of an odd comparison. Um, but nonetheless, this was the first time that a, a trial was done where, where stem cell was compared against something else. And uh, the type of uh, consolidation that they got was the intermediate, um, intermediate type of chemo. And uh, a lot of these patients had features of progressive MS already, uh, as, as I'm trying to show that they're down on the bottom. And in terms of how they did, stem cell actually seemed to win. Um, it reduced by 80% the number of new MRI spots. It, uh, patients who got stem cell transplants uh, really did not show evidence of new active enhancing lesions later on, and there was a reduction in the relapse rate as well. So patients who got stem cell therapy did better than the comparator. Um, one thing, though, to note is that when you look at actually how well people were functioning, their level of disability, there really was not a significant improvement. But it's important to remember that most of the patients in this trial already had progressive MS. 
So the takeaway point from this study was that it's, it's small, as most of these are. Uh, a lot of patients were progressive, but it was the first time that we saw stem cell therapy actually beat um, another type of medicine. Though in fairness, it's a medicine that we would probably rarely, if ever, use. So this is a trial that's kind of a hot topic right now called the MIST trial. And um, this is a randomized clinical trial that took place. Uh, there was a United States site uh, in Northwestern, as well as the United Kingdom, Sweden, and Puerto Rico. These were patients who had relapsing MS, um, and they had active disease, meaning they had two or more recent um, clinical relapses or an MRI change. They, were, uh, they had MS that was, that was severe, but it wasn't too severe. Their, their scores were kind of right in the middle. And you couldn't get into this trial if you had progressive MS, and you also couldn't get into this trial if you had certain other types of um, kind of highly effective medications. But basically, when you compare the groups, there was about the same number of men and women and about the same ages that were seen, and patients who went into the trial had already been on MS medications, uh, and more or less people had the same types of prior exposures. Um, as you can see, the s most patients that were in this trial had already been on three other meds for their MS. So in other words, they had kind of refractory bad multiple sclerosis. Um, so what, ha what happened here is that basically half of the patients were um, put into an arm of the trial where they could stay they could stay on an MS medication, something that's equally judged to be equally as effective what they're already taking or something better. Key point is that they could not get two of these medications, which are some that we think of as maybe some of the, the more effective medications that are currently available. The other um, arm of patients had their, whatever their MS treatment was, it was washed out and then they received a stem cell transplant. Now, one thing is that after a year of doing this, if you were someone who was given a, a disease-modifying therapy, you had the option of then going to get a stem cell transplant if you wanted. And actually, as it turned out, 110 patients were randomized in this trial. And of those, 50 of them that got the stem cell, or excuse me, 50 of them that got the uh, disease-modifying therapy, 31 of them ended up crossing over to, to actually, they wanted a stem cell transplant after the one year. Um, the way that this was done was essentially a, what we call one of the lower intensity regimens. Um, and uh, as far as the patients who did not get a stem cell transplant, those who got an MS medication, these are the different ones that they received. Uh, and so some of the ones at the top are maybe some of the medications that we generally consider to be some of the more effective medications, but there was kind of a, a pretty good mix. And what we looked at well, not we, but what they looked at um, through time is how, what was the difference between the two groups in terms of getting worse, having worsening disability scores, um, as well as relapses. And the neurologists who tried to make those determinations, the idea here was that they could not know which type of treatment the patient was getting, which can be tricky if you've had a stem cell transplant because oftentimes you will lose your hair. And so because of that, the patients all wore wigs. And basically what was found is that when you look at the stem cells, at five years, only about 9.7% um, had progression of their disability compared to patients who got MS medications. Um, we saw that that was more around the order of 75% uh, over that period of time. And also the stem cell patients got better in terms of their disability score improving from a score of 3.38 down to 2.36. Whereas those patients who got the MS medications tended to do worse over that period of time. When you look at how long it took for patients to get a relapse, if you were on medication, um, about 85% of those patients by the end of five years. And then the stem cell group, we saw that it was only 15%. When you do a talk, you're not supposed to do this because that is like the worst slide ever. Uh, so never do this. But the, the only thing that I wanted to point out is that when you look at all the other things that they looked at in terms of outcome, improvement in disability scores, improvement in uh, volume or size of the amount of damage that was seen, the patients had improvement in their walk times, improvement in their nine hole peg test times, and improvement in patient reported outcomes as well. And so we talked earlier today about this concept of NIDA or no evidence of disease activity. Um, it's something that we're shooting for as much as possible. 
And uh, when you look at the rates of NIDA in the patients who received this transplant, as opposed to those who received uh, disease-modifying therapy, what you'll see is that uh, at five years, 78.5% uh, of patients who got stem cells met that, as opposed to about 3% of patients who did not. Now, those patients who, for one year, stayed on their MS medicine, um, and then they said, well, I do want to get a stem cell transplant. Uh, what you see is that their disability score has improved as well. And so if you follow this down, you see that their disability score uh, improved. Yeah, so even those people who did it later saw improvement. So I've, all I've done is basically show you how awesome this, this is, but you all, there's a total other side of the coin to talk about, and that is toxicity. Um, so in this particular trial, and we'll look at stem cell transplant as a whole in just a minute, but there certainly are adverse effects, I and mean, it wasn't just a cakewalk getting this done. So 13% of patients had really high fever, uh, had uh, infections. We saw different types of derangements in their electrolytes. Patients had uh, heart arrhythmia. One patient had a heart arrhythmia. Um, elevated lab testing, different types of infections. The patient had a seizure. When you look at the two different groups, compare stem cell versus disease-modifying therapy, in general, though, you see that the rate of infection is about the same, which is this bottom line here. So about the rate um, of infection per year was about 19% uh, versus 23% if you've got a, a disease-modifying therapy. So the trial, the reason I spent so much time talking about that trial is just that it's the first time that we actually had stem cell versus something else. Um, but it's still a small sample of patients. It's not like we had hundreds and hundreds of patients here. Uh, a lot of patients crossed over after that first year so uh, to get a transplant. So we don't have tons of information on the patients who stayed on disease-modifying therapy. Um, a huge point to point out is that we did not really, they did not look at the effects of these two very potent MS medications. Patients who got these were not included in the study. So what we'll do now is we'll go into complications of stem cell, uh, stem cell therapy as a whole, not just within the context of that trial I just mentioned, but just over the years. So if you look at this, this is very important. Um, this is a review that I referenced earlier of 281 patients over about 20 years, and it's looking at mortality or death 100 days or less from the time that they had their transplant. Um, and it's, it is, I mean, 2.8% chance of death. Um, so it is, you know, very, it's nothing to, uh, you know, to obviously just take it quite seriously. And when we look at causes of death that are 100 days out or later, so three months or later, 10% of patients, when you look at um, this big group of patients, again, over the past, you know, really 20 years. And there were about nine malignancies found of different types. Uh, it kind of cut off at the bottom, but a lot of, about nine patients in total had other types of autoimmune problems that developed um, as a result of getting this transplant. So there, there is serious uh, risk, but probably one important thing that I also wanted to mention is that when you look through time, you're going to see a trend here. So this is on the bottom here. It's every year. And then the blue bar, the patients that got stem cell transplants for MS that year, and then the smaller, darker bar are the patients who, had, who, who passed away. And what you'll see is that when you divide this time up between 1995 and 2000, the mortality rate was around 7.3%, but then in the following seven years, it improved to 1.3%, and if you look at the time from 2008 to present, it's down to about 0.7%. So in other words, even though it's got a severe amount of risk associated with it, the, it appears that, we're, it appears that um, people are getting better at doing it. One other thing I wanted to mention is that when you look at patients who get stem cell transplants, they're different in a lot of ways than patients who are enrolled in normal MS trials. They typically have a higher level of baseline disability. Their baseline score of disability on a scale of one to 10 is right in the middle, which is a lot higher than what we sometimes see when patients are enrolled in, in normal trials. Also, these patients tended to have lots of relapses, lots of inflammation in their MS, and in general, um, most of them have lots of prior treatments. So basically, these patients are very, uh, they have severe MS, typically speaking. 
Back to this concept of NIDA, or no evidence of disease activity. When you look at NIDA, um, and you look at trials of different MS medications, these are where the NIDAs kind of map out to, compared to some of the stem cell trials that we've mentioned, um, appear to actually be a little bit more effective at reaching NIDA compared to other trials. One thing that's important to point out is that most of the early stem cell trials, they're all what we call cohort studies. In other words, there was no, it really wasn't ethical to take a, a patient who has severe MS and to give them nothing um, as, a, as, a compare, as a comparison to stem cell transplant. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, these patients typically have high levels of disability and a lot of them had progressive disease. In fact, when we look back at those numbers between 1996 and 2005, a lot of them, 78% had progressive MS at that point. So what do we know about um, what do we know about how well it works and who it works the best in? Basically, patients who are younger, patients who have more inflammation, and patients who have been on a fewer number of prior MS medications. Those seem to be the groups of people who respond the best to stem cell treatment. And so part of the idea here is how do you find the right person for this type of procedure? Um, this is a list showing lots of different trials, and what I want to highlight here is that through time, we're now starting to see that stem cell trials are including patients with less uh, disability from the get-go and more uh, relaxing patients. So previously, if you look here, a lot of these trials, the percentage of patients with relapsing MS is like 0, 22%. Now it's a lot higher, up in 80s and 90s and even as we talked about one trial, nearly 100%. So it, so it goes basically to show that if you can pick patients with the right characteristics, they may do well with this type of treatment. And also mortality is better too. So since 2005, there's less mortality. Patients who have lower baseline disabilities have less mortality. Patients who have um, more relaxing or inflammation in their MS, they have less mortality. Younger patients do better. And uh, also, depending upon the type of chemo that you pick to ablate the immune system, we see that those who got the lower intensity or the less risky regimens also do better. So what's going on now is um, a really interesting idea. And the idea here is let's compare people who get stem cell transplants versus one of the most highly effective therapies that we have, alentuzumab. And this is a trial that is currently recruiting patients, and most of them are in the um, Scandinavian region. Um, but even in the United States, there's going to be a trial called BMS. And what's going to happen here is that one half of the patients are going to get a stem cell transplant uh, with an, of what we call an intermediate kind of range intensity. And then the other group is going to have the chance to take one of the more highly effective uh, MS medications that are available. So what we'll do here is just spend a minute or two talking about changing pace into something called mesenchymal stem cells. Um, how's my time? Am I done? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so mesenchymal stem cells, just to change gears really quick. So this is a totally different idea. Everything we've talked about is getting rid of your immune system, uh, letting it regrow with new stem cells. Mesenchymal stem cells, here, nothing gets ablated. You don't, go to the, you don't go to your immune system and get rid of it. In fact, what you do is you take this other population of cells um, and you collect them from yourself and they get multiplied in number and they get reinfused back into you. And they don't work in the same way. They have other kinds of characteristics, including what we hope may be the ability to help repair old damage, which is totally different than what we've been talking about. And a lot of times when people hear stem cell, they always think that's what it is, that it's a way to, to like repair or regrow the brain. This is definitely an infancy. There's a lot more work to be done. But the idea here of a mesenchymal stem cell is, is there a way to actually give somebody something back so that they can get some improvement um, in damage that's already occurred? So most of the trials that have been done are, are early trials, um, basically looking for safety. Is it safe to do this in the first place? This was a group of just 20 patients and they received infusions of these mesenchymal stem cells in early, early data for sure. But it is interesting in that there does seem to be, be some signs that they do a little bit better 
this graph shows um, basically their disability scores, and when they go down, it's showing that they're having improvement in their disability scores through time over one year. Another trial is looking at mesenchymal stem cells right now, and it's just about ready to finish enrolling all the patients in the trial. And um, these are progressive MS patients, and they're receiving uh, these mesenchymal stem cells to try to see, one, do they do better? And then secondly, they're looking at changes on their MRI scans. I just left some slides in here for other examples of these mesenchymal stem cell trials that are ongoing right now. So um, one word of caution, though, is that um, the, the world of stem cell is also, in a way, unregulated, and that there's a concept called stem cell tourism, where people are going to place, different types of places and receiving stem cell transplants, um, oftentimes you know, with their own money. They're not, obviously, um, they're paying out of pocket a lot of times. It's not being covered by their insurance. Um, what are they getting? Um, who is doing it? Are they going to a center that is uh, you know, meeting standard criteria for how this is done? Um, or what type of stem cell are they receiving? What type of follow-up will occur? So the idea, a lot of people have excitement, for sure, and they should, I think, regarding stem cells, but we have to be careful in terms of how it's being done. Um, and I think probably the, definitely the, the, the most appropriate way is kind of in the context of these randomized trials so that we can learn more uh, about how well it's working. So in conclusion, this is an emerging field for sure, and I think really exciting. Um, the autologous hematopoietic stem cell, AHSCT, that we talked about for the majority of the talk has the best evidence, the most evidence, and remember what this is doing is resetting the immune system. Mesenchymal stem cells, these are also gaining some popularity, but there has not been nearly as much done in this field. This is more in the repair field uh, compared to the, the bone marrow, uh, AHSCT. The, the concept at the very beginning of the other types of stem cells, including embryonic stem cells and induced pluripotent stem cells, this stuff may hold promise, but it's definitely more at the, at the level of kind of basic science where we're looking at what's happening at the level of animals rather than a human so far. And I think just remember that stem cell therapy, AHCT, AHSCT, seems to be the best when patients are highly active, young, and probably less disabled, which I think is true in general for most of our uh, highly effective therapies. And it does carry risk. So this is definitely something that, um, and this needs to be for the person who is willing to take more risk up front and you know, with, the, with the idea of potentially having more benefit at the end. Um, the technique in general is getting better. The rates of complications, I think, are getting better through time, for sure, which is reassuring. Um, but we need agreement on what is the best method of doing this. What, you know, how standardized can this be? Do we do a high intensity, a medium, or a low intensity regimen? You know, which is the, which is the best way? And I definitely exercise caution when it comes to stem cell tourism, going to these stem cell clinics where it's really unclear how much regulation is happening, what you're receiving, what type of follow-up you're gonna get. Um, and I think very importantly, what we need to do, what we should be having in the, in, the, in the near future is the results of how well does a stem cell transplant do compared to something that's a, high, a really highly effective therapy. So I think more will come from that soon. And I'm going to stop blabbering with that. Um, be happy to answer any questions. I think I have a couple minutes. Yeah. Um, so it depends. The uh, that's another issue that I didn't necessarily bring up. The uh, the missed trial. A lot of patients, I believe, are privately funding that. I don't think that it's all NIH funded, which is another whole other issue. Um, you know, paying a lot of money for something to get done and then and not necessarily have the guaranteed outcome. Um, so it depends on where the trial is done. So in a lot of the European nations, these are more these are funded by their government health systems. Um, but yeah, there's a mix in terms of how it's being done in terms of the United States right now. Yeah, sure. A little question. For va vaccinations, how does it affect? Yeah, so probably need revaccinated. Um, yeah, revaccinated with all of your 
vaccines because what we see are the, the B cells, um, which are important for that immunity go down. And so, yeah, revaccinating. And then definitely getting your annual flu shot every year, too. Yeah? I don't know if this makes any sense. Has there ever been a test, or will there be a test of mixing the two, the autologous and the mesenchymal? The mesenchymal? That's an interesting idea. It's like you're doing, uh, I think one concept in the field in general is like, how can we give, how can we treat MS by reducing inflammation, but then also treat MS by giving ways, you know, improving damage that's already happened, which would be the idea there. Um, but yeah, as far as I know, I don't think that those have been looked at in conjunction as much as they're, they're still, they're still separated. And I think the mesenchymal stem cell trials are typically taking more progressive patients um, to try to see if, you know, what can happen with improvement there. All right. Thanks very much.